So um, I'm going to give just a sort of a very short um, presentation about a project that we are that we have done recently that is now uh, in review. And this is using some longitudinal data, so data collected basically in the same place over a number of years, right? And in this particular case, it happens to be one of those stars that Town showed uh, in his previous presentation, one of those stars that was the very well-collected data point for amphibians. And one of those places is Mount Managuba, which is just a little north of here. Uh, when Rafe and town, you guys go to the Rumpy Hills, it's just north of the Rumpies, is Mount Managuba, which is a hot spot for amphibian diversity. So here it is. Here's, just as a reminder, here's Mount Cameroon, where we are. So Managuba's up here. It's a mountain that has a big volcanic caldera in it. And the other focus of this study is another place that's pretty reasonably well collected, uh, Mount Oku. Uh, but some of the data that are the surveys from Mount Oku are not specimen based. So they're, you know, people taking observations of them, which is why they're not appearing um, in GBIF and things like that. So Mananguba and Oku are probably the two most well-collected mountains for amphibians uh, in Cameroon. There's a lot of other smaller mountains, but these are two that we've been visiting as scientists for the past like four decades. So we have a lot of information about these and we feel like we're pretty confident about what species occur there. Uh, and including recently in the last 10 years, I've either from my work or from specimens that I've collected, describe new species from these places too. So we're pretty reasonably confident that we know what species occur on these two mountains. And so all of what I'm going to show is a collaboration of field data that's pulled together from uh, Mareka Hirschfeld, who is a grad student in Germany, myself from my graduate student work, Tom Doherty Bone, who's a graduate student in the UK, uh, and Nono Ganwo, who Walter works with. And uh, Nono's work at Mount Managuba played a big part of this work. So what this is, is just a, an amazing condensation of surveys in the same place through time. And this is, each one of these little plots is a species. And don't pay attention to the black and white right now, but just each is basically showing a, the proportion of search events in that year that resulted in finding that species, right? So some of these, like Arthroleptis, which is what I work on, they're really common, and you find them almost every time you go out, about half the time you go out to survey, you find an Arthroleptus. They're just very common species. Some of these are very uncommon. Uh, it's true for types of Cardioglossa. Uh, some species of, let's see, what's a good one? Some species of, say, a Phryxilis at high elevations, at least, are hard to find sometimes. Some species of Leptodactylodon. But what you'll see is that each species is, is different, right? Some species have sort of high detectability. They're easy to find. Some species are hard to find. And what we were interested in is that a few years ago, we realized that on these mountains, certain species were becoming very hard to find. And in fact, there were certain species we couldn't find at all. And what really um, clued us in that there might be an interesting story here was that one of the species that was in fact the species that was so common that we just wouldn't collect it at all, was the species that we couldn't find at all anymore. And so we had this, what seemed to be anecdote between, you know, oh, my field notes 10 years ago, we found so many of them, and then now no one can find any. That's a pretty clear distinction between lots and none. And we were interested in, you know, how much does that hold across all the species diversity that we find in these mountains? And because we had longitudinal survey data, you know, from this year to this year to this year to this year, we could begin comparing all of our survey results that we had and looking to see, you know, was there any change in the frequency that you encounter these species through time? And so what we seem to be finding in some species, um, let's see, what's a good example? So this Phrynobotrachus species, was early on very common. You'd find it in about a third to a quarter of every time you went out at night, dropped to basically where we never find it at all. Uh, the same is true for some, this species of Phrynobotrachus. And Phrynobotrachus are these little terrestrial frogs, which hopefully when we're in the lowlands we'll see them, but they tend to be very fragile. And now, you know, they've dropped from being among the most common things we found to being things we don't find at all. Uh, and so we're finding different patterns across species. Some species seem to basically be no different across survey years and some are changing dramatically. The interesting context for this is that in the same time frame, and I just want to point out that this is actually within the last 10 years. This is not over 50 years or 20 years. This is over just basically the last 10 years we've seen this pattern happen. 
And so the interesting context here is that in the last 10 years is when we think that um, chytrid fungus, which is this pathogen that causes a disease in many amphibian species, within the last 10 years we believe that this fungus has emerged as present in the mountains here in Cameroon. That when I started doing my survey work in 2004 and even 2006, we actually don't think the fungus was here then. We've gone back through and screened specimens that I collected as a graduate student and we can't find chytrid fungus among any of those. And then even in 2007, you hear there's 250 animals that were screened and none were found to be, uh, have chytrid. But suddenly in 2011, which admittedly is a few years later, in 2011 we find you know, every time we look for chytrid we find it. Right? And so we think in this, this landscape we've seen chytrid emerge and what seems to be that these populations are declining at the same time. A lot of other things are happening in these mountains. As Walter mentioned, you know, Mount Bambutos, which is a third mountain, seems to maybe have the same pattern, uh, but we have a lot less data for Mount Bambutos. But in Mount Bambutos, there's a lot of landscape change. There's been a lot more use of pesticides uh, recently. Like last couple times we've gone out, you find many more bags of fungicide and pesticide like laying next to streams. So it could be that uh, this chytrid fungus, the emergence of it in the mountains is causing declines of amphibian species. That's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is just that there's been more increased um, change, uh, landscape change and the way in which the landscapes are used by humans is changing rapidly. Uh, and obviously, I mean, Walter, you knew that and mentioned that for a different mountain. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like when we screen chytrid fungus over the last century, we have basically one positive that we've been able to find based on museum collections um, for Cameroon. So they're very uncommon. And then, you know, in 2011, 2013, we can find 30 to 50% of the specimens have chytrid fungus. And so if we bin our observations into before the first observation and after the uh, first observation on both Mount Mananguba and Mount Oku, we actually see that even the number of species that we find every time we go out is significantly less now than it was before there was chytrid fungus. And so it seems like there is some sort of decline that's happening here. And right now this is really correlative, right? This is not proving causation that this fungus is causing the declines. But just based on our survey data in a single place through time, we're understanding, right, that something is happening to this fauna. Some species seem to be the same as they were 10 years ago, and some species are incredibly uncommon, uh, whereas 10 years ago we could find them, you know, half the time we went out. So something is happening to that. Without that sort of longitudinal data of the same site through time, we don't really have that important information to understand, you know, how these faunas, how these floras are changing. And so this is important information for us uh, because it turns out there are certain species that are very very affected. A lot of these Phrynobotrachus species, which have very similar biology, they used to be quite uh, frequently encountered and now we can't find them. Some of the Cardioglosa species are like this as well. And this has led us to begin thinking about conservation projects, right? So because we had this survey data in these places and we knew that some species were common and now they're not, we're beginning, just having that data is important for making us begin to think about, you know, what should we be doing for conservation? Had we not had that survey data from a particular place through time, we wouldn't really have that context to think that, oh, maybe declines are happening here. Because we don't find sick and dying frogs all the time. We're just finding them to be more uncommon. And so this has spurred us to take, um, to start doing some projects based on conservation. So this is in Lake Oku. This is the Lake Oku clawed frog. And so recently uh, we've started doing some conservation projects for these where we bring them back to the academy as live frogs. We package them up like this. And we can, at the academy where I work now, are working on little conservation projects trying to understand the biology of these frogs to help conserve them in the wild before these and other species disappear. And this is something that, you know, we really wouldn't have much context for thinking that declines were happening unless we had these data through time that had been back, going back to the same site again and again and again and slowly realizing that in fact you know something is changing why it's changing we don't know but we do think that you know something is changing in the fauna through time and that you know that's kind of now making us want to take action as far as conservation so that's that's all i had are there any questions about it 